Ladies and gentlemen, independent Americans around the country, around the world, and around the universe, we are very privileged to bring you a bit of a change of pace. Uh, a man that I have admired, that I have watched, that I respect, and I'm just a huge fan of. Uh, a guy who's had a really interesting, inspiring story. We always want to bring important, inspiring, iconic Americans. And if you are a fan of this man, you're going to love this. If you're not, you will be by the end. Uh, a, a guy that, that, that really is a, a man of the moment in many ways. The great and powerful Wes Chatham joins us here on Independent Americans. Welcome, <laughs> my friend. Hey, brother. It's good to see you, man. I, it's an honor to be here. I'm really, uh, really happy to be here with you. Well, I'm psyched to talk to you. I'm a huge fan. Um, I'm a huge fan of The Expanse. I'm a huge fan of you. Uh, and we are both huge fans of Ron Perlman because that's how yeah. I initially got in touch with you. The man, he's been on this show, I think twice, maybe three times. The first time I interviewed him when he was in his car driving around Los Angeles like a madman with his hair on fire. Uh -huh. um, but we, <laughs> we met through Ron. So how did you, how'd you meet Perlman? I got to ask you that, man. I met I met Perma for the first time. Uh, we were doing this uh, uh, we were doing this pilot, Hand to God, and uh, we did this pilot with Mark Forster, uh, which ended up being a show. Um, I ended up going to do The Expanse. Uh, there was a long period between the show and then uh, getting picked up as as a series, and we hit it off right away. I the, he nobody makes me laugh like Ron. I just think he's such a character, and he just he just he just gets to me, and he's really intelligent and hyper talented one of the things that uh you know ron has such an ease about him and he seems like he's always having fun and always playing around but he is extremely intelligent and very very good at his job so i have a lot of respect for him and we hit it off and then uh, i ended up doing a movie called hand to god uh with blake lively and jason patrick and his company uh, was one of the producers, um, Wing and a Prayer Productions, was part of the uh, production. And we all went to Thailand, and that's when we really, we just had a blast. I mean, we were out there for a couple months, and we just had a good time. And so we became uh, really good friends and, and uh, stayed in touch. And he sent me, he introduced me to you on a text. And I knew right away, I said, well, if this guy's a friend of Ron, then he's, he's my type of guy. <laughs> and uh, we started texting back and forth and I started listening to some of your stuff and, um, and uh, this podcast and reading about you. And, uh, and I think, you know, I think you have such a great authentic voice and it's something that fires me up and I have a lot of respect for you. And I think uh, it's a, it's a real privilege to be here and to be a part of this thing. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, I think, I think this is going to be a great, uh, platform for you. And I think you're gonna do big things. So I'm just glad to uh, get to hang out with you for a little bit. I appreciate that, man. We're in this crew, the, the FORs, the friends of Ron, right? This extended network. <laughs> like, right. If, if we ever all got together in one place, I mean, it would, yeah. a lot of law enforcement would be notified. I mean, that, that would be a, a wild, <laughs> yeah. a wild guy. And the idea of going to Thailand with Ron Perlman is a whole nother level, right? Um, yeah, but I, yeah. I appreciate that, man. I mean, we're trying to bring people together and add light. And I, I told you when we were warming up, it, it kind of feels like the Rasinante a little bit sometimes where it's us against the world, but it really matters. And, and your yeah. work matters, your voice matters. Let me ask you this. Yeah. I want to get into your Navy service. I want to get in to hopefully what's coming up on the expanse. Want to get into, you know, your thoughts on all things, but I've been asking everybody, uh, it's been a difficult year. And folks have been grinding it out. They've been trying to find the light. It looks like we're coming out uh, out of this hard time and, and the light at the end of the tunnel is here. But Wes, where are you and, and how are you? What's the last year been like for you and, and the people close to you? Well, I'm in a little town uh, south of Atlanta in Georgia. Um, I, was, uh, I just got here last week. This is where my family is, but I was in Toronto uh, shooting season six. Uh, I was up there for about five months. Um, and we just wrapped and I just got back, uh, to, to this little town in Georgia. I don't want to say the name of the town cause I love how small it is. And, and there's been a lot of people, it's a beautiful, beautiful little town. And there's been, uh, since the shutdown of the pandemic, there's been a lot of people coming in and, um, I wanted to stay a little town. So, uh, <laughs> so I keep it. We, we were talking earlier about how much we love, you know, little town, small pace, you know, you're, you're up in the mountains up in New York. So, you know, you, you we're, we're the same breed. Yeah. It's, you know, we're both in an undisclosed location for important reasons. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Absolutely. And you, we were also talking, you know, you were away from your family for a long period of time, you know, across the mm-hmm. border and you've got mm-hmm. young kids. I've got young kids. It, it, it kind of fit, mm-hmm. must have felt like a deployment. I want to get into your Navy service, but, you know, being away right. from your family during all this that was going on, you know, what was that like? And, and what are your takeaways from you've been through some hard stuff in your life, but what's what's this last year and that part of it been like for you? Yeah, well, uh, you know, what? it did remind me of a deployment. I did. I have I did two um, uh, West Pacific tours um, and uh, when, um, when, you know, but at the time I didn't have kids. And so uh, just being a single guy going out, it wasn't really, uh, I did two West packs and being a single guy going out, it wasn't really that big of a deal, but now just going off to shoot a TV show uh, and being locked in Toronto because it's completely shut down, the border shut down. So I wasn't able to go back and forth. So it felt like uh, in, in some ways like a deployment, but it also really made me respect all the men and women serving now or the people that I served with, um, because the added stre- the added stress and how how much you miss your family and how much you miss your kids I never had that when I was in because I was a single person but to to see what um, these people accomplish and what they're up against and the kind of conditions that they're living in uh, but also on top of that being away from their family it just really puts in in perspective for me the sacrifice that these people these uh, men and women are making for us. And uh, it just, it, it just, it, it, it I just had uh, that much more respect for what they're doing. Hmm. Um, and then, so I, I feel hesitant to compare it because I was doing a TV show where uh, I didn't have anywhere, you know, I was, I was being pampered. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't have anywhere you know, near uh, the challenges they do. I feel you. Cause I didn't have kids when I was in and uh, you know, at that time, I used to tell people, you know, it, for, for me, it's okay. Like I'm out there. I know what I'm doing. It's much harder on my family. You know, my, my dad mm-hmm. watched TV all the time. My mother sold her television, right? Like they didn't want to know. They approached it in different ways. Now my kid gets on the school bus and I'm like a mess, right? I'm a puddle trying yeah. to watch my kindergartner go go off. Um, but I think that that, well, that perspective- It's is- funny you say that. I, I'll, I'll put it in here. It's funny you say that because, you know, I think we get to a certain point in life where we're like, okay, you figure out how to, protect yourself you figure out the things that uh you know you you know yourself better you know you to kind of like to to uh separate yourself from the world create these protective barriers but then you have and then you as soon as you just figure it out as soon as you're like all right i feel like i'm at peace then you have kids and then it's like your beating heart is outside of your body and you and you, you can't use your defense mechanisms that you've acquired over the years to look after it it just it's like all over again that's uh, it. You, na- you nailed it. You na- I, I said that before. I think I think Obama said it once. He said having kids is like having your heart outside your body. And I think especially in, in times like this, right? Like, you know, I have so much respect yeah. for my I tell him every day, like my five year old is like a warrior. He's suiting up. He's going into an unknown environment, like watching him get ready for school is, is like, you know, us leaving the wire in Iraq years ago. I mean, it's different. Yeah. But for him, you know, he's facing fear that we couldn't comprehend it at that at that age. Right. And, and now it's right. a whole new world. But let me let me take you back. I want to ask you some questions. I ask everybody if you're in Thailand with with Ron Perlman or maybe when you were in the Navy, everybody has a drink of choice. So West Chatham, mm-hmm. what was your what is or was your drink of choice? Well, I'm seasonal, right? <laughs> so uh, in the summer, when it's hot, I like tequila. Um, and uh, I like a really nice tequila, uh, like a 1492 Blanco or something like that. Uh, it's in the winter. I like a little bit of bourbon. Uh, when, and it's weird because if it's real cold, uh, I like beer, which I know it's reversed that people would like it when it when it's hot. Um, and uh, and I like red wine. I like red wine in the fall. So I'm, I'm a seasonal drinker. But I will tell you, I, I'm, I'm having to reevaluate my relationship to alcohol because it's, it's just not the same as it used to be. Um, and uh, I, you know, and I, so I've experienced, I've yeah. experimented with like just times of not drinking. And I, I think I went a year and a half at one point of not drinking. Um, and I, I enjoy it. Like I enjoy, you know, I, I think it'd be nice if you and I were having a beer right now while we're talking. I enjoy so much about it. But at the end of the day, man, it's just, uh, it's just too many challenges that come along with it that, that yeah, make it not I worth it as you, well, no, as you no. get older. 
number one, you're a Renaissance man now. So I, I appreciate the, the, the complicated, the appropriately complicated answer. That was a great, great answer. And I would expect no less, <laughs> but also, you know, alcohol is an ass kicker when you get old, when you got little ones and you're trying, and now, you know, you know, maybe, maybe in the Navy, you, you know, when you were taking your shirt off, people were taking pictures of you, but now you got to be lean and mean <laughs> for this, for this right. global sensation that is your TV show, man. So that's a good moment. But I, I, you know, I went, I told people this on the show, I went a couple months during the pandemic, completely cold Turkey. You know, my blood pressure was too high. I was just drinking, you know, too much. And I said, I'm going to try to do cold Turkey. And I did it. And, and it was one of the hardest things I had to do, especially during the pandemic. But so we're growing up. We're well, what, what do you like to drink? I really like, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to say I'm a lot like you, like my, my wife loves tequila. I love tequila. When I, when I tried to drop weight, cause I'm trying to drop weight again, I got to do clear liquor. So I, I got to do vodka mm -hmm. and tequila. Otherwise like the brown stuff and the beer makes you fat. And then, mm -hmm. and my doc was like, Hey man, you'd be better off. If you dropped another 10 pounds. So I'm going to try to shred that down. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I, frankly, I've talked about this on the show. I smoke weed more. I mean, it, it's a better release yeah. for me. It's better on my body. Uh, it's better yeah. on my mind and now it's legal in New York and many other places. So I think it's, it's a game I, changer. I, I never understood. And I still don't understand how alcohol is kind of accepted, but something like weed, well, I guess it's changing is, is, is changing really fast, but weed was, was the bad. I remember growing up and like, I, I remember, you know, my dad never had any restrictions on me not drinking. Um, it just, it was a part of his life and he didn't care if it was a part of mine. And, so it was just natural. It was part of growing up. I'd come home from school and grab a beer out of the refrigerator and sit down and watch TV with him. But marijuana now, that was a big no-no. That was, you know, whoa, you're going down the wrong path. But if you really look at it, you look at like health and longevity and the impact it has on your body. Um, overwhelmingly, you know, marijuana is a, 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 has way more health benefits and, and a more positive impact on your body and your mind than alcohol does. Um, I, I feel you on that, man. We talked about this with John Bernthal, who I told you when we were when we were warming up here, like, you know, I, I can't wait to see the two of you guys in a movie together one day. And I, maybe we could throw Ron Perlman in there, too, um, because yeah. you, you guys are all badasses. And, you're, you know, the discipline you talked about um, probably serves you well when you're on set, because just coincidentally, maybe it was, I don't know how many years ago, 10 years ago, me and IAVA partnered with Matt Damon and Paul Greengrass on the, on the Green Zone the film about the green mm -hmm. zone in Iraq. And now it's trending on Netflix this week. And I'm getting all these notes because I have this short like cameo in it where I pop up and I play uh, Colonel Gonzalez, a great casting, of course, right? But uh, yeah. you know, I have this little piece, but all the guys in the film around Matt were vets and we cast them. Yeah. And I remember being on set and we were in England at the time and then they shot in Morocco and Spain and all the makeup people, all the people on set used to say, man, you guys are awesome. Like, we don't really have to feed you. You're out in the sun all the time. You know, you're getting your asses kicked and you never complain. You guys are just happy. These guys are getting paid three times what they used to get paid. They're staying in a hotel. They're in a movie with Matt Damon. They're getting, you know, drinks at the bar at night. This is, this is like the best deployment on earth, right? Yeah, that, it makes me, it, it pisses me off sometimes when we're uh, in just, I just, you know, ultimately getting it, getting uh, the, being able to do what I've always dreamed of doing and being in this environment where you're well taken care of and coming from other worlds where, where it was a lot harder to getting along. Uh, whenever I hear complaining or I hear, you know, whining about something, it's like, what are you, what are we whining about? Let's try to go build the house in upstate New York in the wintertime, you know, <laughs> go on deployment. You know, and, and it's uh, so um, it's it's a you know so that that's one of the things that just really bothers me about it. And then you know, I'm sure that the, yeah, yeah, it's good I'm perspective, sure man. Noticed. But I think it serves you well because I mean, I, I said this I think with Bernthal and I've said it with others, my friends who've done well, you know, in especially in entertainment, almost any industry, but especially in entertainment, where you look, there's, there's a lot of good-looking people, there's a lot of talented people, there's a lot of people who they could pick for a part. You know, I said this about mm -hmm. Bernthal and about my friend Teddy and I'm sure about Ron, like when you know their work ethic and you know they're a good mm -hmm. person and there's somebody you want to mm -hmm. be in the foxhole with, you get the job over somebody else. I've seen that happen to so many of my friends yeah. in many different industries. But let me ask you, Wes Chatham, go way back in the way, way back machine, back to whether it was North Georgia or somewhere else. What was mm -hmm. your very first car? My first car was a 1984 Berlinetta Camaro. 
And it was uh, my dad's friend, Kenny Vaughn, who used to buy and fix up cars and sell them. Out of the kindness of his heart, he gave me that car. Pretty much just gave it to me. I think I paid him $300 for it. And, uh, and it had T-tops. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, people like to say it was brown, but it was gold. It was gold. I'll hang on. <laughs> But, uh, it, you know, it was in such a state that I remember one time uh, a buddy of mine was driving the car and we were all packed in. There was like three in the back and, and two of us up front. We were going to a party and he pulled up and these girls uh, showed up and they were like, is this your car? He goes, hell no. And, and, and he goes, Wes, I'm sorry, but I got to stop driving this thing before people think this is my car. <laughs> And here it is. I'm thinking like, this is the coolest thing on the planet. It's got, it might be old. It might be beat up. It might need body work. It might, you know, whatever, but, um, it had T-tops and, uh, but yeah, 1984 brilliant in a Camaro. I had a radio on a swivel, you know, so you oh. could swivel it to you and, and do the thing and they could swivel it back. And yeah, I think it was a 305 and it, uh, yeah. I knew, I knew this wouldn't disappoint. And, and I, I usually ask what color it is. And you said it was not uh -huh. brown; it was gold, which which is which it's is... not brown, God damn it! And I and I and I and I and the thing is, is like you know, every, people refuse to see that it's gold. It had like gold flakes in it, and people say yeah. it was brown. They said it was shit brown, but yeah, it yeah. wasn't. It was gold, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. It just required a deeper look, right? Yes, you you, you had to get to know it before yeah. you knew the gold. Before did, did, because it because it showed you, know, you the gold. You know, we'll, we'll talk about the expanse and you're on a different kind of vehicle that is now legendary in the world of entertainment and, and sci-fi. But did you, before we get to the Rosinante and other things, did your car have a name? The Berlinetta. That's what we always called it because it was the Berlinetta Camaro. We call it the Berla or the Burley or the Berlinetta. Yeah, that's what we, that's what we, uh, that's what we called it. Ladies and gentlemen, West Chatham's, West Chatham's not going to disappoint you with stories today. I promise you that. <laughs> so, let's, so let's build on that because, you know, some folks, I know your fans are going to devour this episode and they're going to really enjoy right. this. But some folks are going to be newer to you, to your career, to your work. You've got one of these great origin stories, right? Like you, you served mm -hmm. in the Navy. Right. And can you tell us about, you know, what you were doing in the Navy and, and this moment? with Denzel Washington and a film they're shooting on your ship, which is, which is one of, it, it's almost like, you know, Henry Rollins told the story about how he got the lead singer job in, in Black Flag when he was working at Baskin Robbins. And it's this great, right. you know, founding legend story. But tell us, you know, right. in whatever version you like, the, 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 the story of what happened on that ship one day. Right, well, and I, as I was saying this, I'm, it's the truth. This is the God's honest truth. And we can, you can get mystical, spiritual. All I'm going to tell is the empirical facts of what happened in this situation. Um, so my whole life, I've always been attracted to story. And I've always been, I've always lived in my imagination. It's really the only thing that I really cared about, you know, growing up. And uh, I always had this eternal compass that, that somehow I wanted to be involved with this thing. And I was a wild child growing up. I didn't really have much uh, supervision or anything. So I, I, I got, you know, I, I went down some wrong paths. Uh, but thank, you know, thank God I ended up joining the military when I did, because it became the parent that I needed. And it became a, uh, it became uh, also um, positive male role models, you know, that that were ahead of me and that, that I really people that I really respected that kind of demonstrated a, a behavior that I could, you know, strive for. Um, and then, you know, but I'll get to the story, but also, you know, uh, really showing me discipline, the power of discipline and that the real peace can be achieved through discipline, like chaos, you're not going to have, it's, it's going to just, add, it's going to, you know, have an, uh, unrestful mind. But, um, so we were, I was on the flight deck and I was with Petty Officer Jones. Petty Officer Jones was, I think he was 43 or 42 and a sec, still a second class petty officer because old petty officer Jones he liked the booze a little bit and uh he he had some he had a lot of wild years in, in the old days but we we're sitting on the and I love petty officer nobody made me laugh like petty officer Jones and we were on the flight deck and we were we were looking out over the ocean the sun was going down I think we were in the gulf at the time 
and uh and we were did, did, can i tell a long story or is this yeah that's you know, why we, from, we have I'm, no I'm we from, don't have to we don't have to stop for any viagra right. commercials or anything else that's the beauty of this <laughs> format right. you can talk uh yeah because i'm from the south so when we tell stories we got to tell it the right way <laughs> So we're sitting on flight deck, watching the sun go down. Um, and we started talking about what we want to do when we got out of the military. And I told him, he said, you know, I've always loved uh, theater. I've always loved movies. I've always loved that world. I have no idea how to be a part of it, or how, to, how to get into it. But I feel like I, I have a calling for it. I feel like that this is something that I, that I want to do. And, you know, talking like this at that time when you're young and you're in the military and you kind of, if you start talking like, you know, destiny and what you feel like you have a calling for, a lot of people are just like, what the fuck are you talking about, man? Yeah. So I kind of was like, just letting it fly, man. This is how I feel. This is what I want. And he told me the story about, uh, he was on the ship. I can't remember the name of the carrier, but he was on the ship when they were filming Top Gun and he got to, uh, meet Tom Cruise and Val Kilmer and, and uh, and I, you're about to say, well, we're we're close in the same age, so you know, you remember how important Top Gun was to us yes. growing up. I think it's, I think it's single handedly the reason that I spent four years in the Gulf, man. It's like you know, I was, and and then when I'm there, I'm like, maybe I wanted to be an actor, maybe <laughs> maybe I I wanted to, you know. But um, so anyway, he told me the story, and I said, wouldn't it be amazing if they were shooting a movie on my boat or on, on our ship? We were on the Bellawood at the time. We were on the Essex for two years and then we crew swapped in Sasebo, Japan to the Bellawood and we brought, the Bellawood was for deployed and we brought the Bellawood back. And uh, I said, wouldn't it be amazing if they were shooting a movie on the boat? And then he said, well, who, who, would, who would be interesting to have on the boat? Like, who's your favorite actors? And we started talking about it. And he's like, hey man, this is how he's talking. He goes, hey man, you know who I like? I like Denzel Washington. That's, that's who I like. And, uh, and I said, oh man, Denzel, like that's a heavyweight. You know, imagine if somebody like Denzel came on. I Listen to me, look at me in the face. I swear to God, this is the truth that I'm not lying. So cut to uh, time goes by. I think it was after September 11th, like right after September 11th. No, no, either after or right before. And so uh, Petty Officer Jones was standing watch on the flight deck. I was in the gym working out and Petty Officer Jones is standing watch, has somebody covering, leaves the flight deck because he's got this news he's got to tell me. He runs up to the, the, the gym and, and I'm working out. And I swear to God, he had tears in his eyes. And he said, Denzel Washington just walked on ship, aboard the ship. I was like, what? He goes, Denzel, he goes, this is your chance, Chatham. This is your chance. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? I go upstairs and fucking Denzel Washington is walking around the flight deck, scouting it for his film, the Antoine Fisher story. And uh, they chose the Bellawood to do, to be a part of this thing. And so I was in a working party and Master Chief Penton, who's a good friend of mine to this day, I was, on, I was in a working party and uh, we were bringing on, I think we we're about to do, uh, I think we were getting ready to do the Colonel Blitz uh, coming up down in um, Camp Pendleton. And so we were bringing ammo on low, we're bringing food and all supplies. And I was on work party doing all these things. And he came up and he said, Chatham, uh, I heard you wanted to be involved with this movie thing. And I said, yeah. And he said, um, well, you know, they, they're asking military guys to come in and audition. They want authentic military guys to be a part of the thing. And he said, I might, I might let you go be a part of this and audition if you get a haircut. Cause I always, the irony is it's like my hair is shorter now than when I was in, because I always pushed the boundaries on, on haircuts. And uh, so I said, all right, Master Chief, and I went and got a haircut, and then he let me audition for it. And when I went and auditioned, Robbie Reed was the casting director. And I went and auditioned, and she said, thank you. And then I was walking out, and then she brought me, She somebody said, hey, and I went back, and she said, have you done this before? And I said, uh, not not really, you know, but this is something, and she goes, and she said at the time, she said, you can do this if you want to. You can, this can be wow. something you're doing. And, and she said, here's, uh, she goes, are you an actor? And I, and I said, no, I don't think so. I don't know what I am, but, <laughs> but I, I like, I, you know, I'm attracted to this. And, uh, I, and, I'm, and again, you know, people are attracted to different reasons. I just love story. I just love the world of make-believe. It wasn't for any other reason than that, it's simple. 
And so she gave me her number. And, uh, and then when, when I got out, I called her and then there's all kinds of, you know, stories past then, but that'll take up the whole podcast. But, uh, I called her and it was just, it was, it was literally a dream come true. Now to say that, like, you know, that, that was a really mystical, magical moment, but I worked my ass off for, for everything, you know, from that point, that was definitely a great start, but I really had to respect and devote my time to, to learn and understand the craft. And, you know, that, that might be something interesting that uh, what Denzel said to me, if people are watching that might be interested in, in uh, getting into this world or going into becoming an actor, because when, uh, so we were, we, you know what? Oh, sh I swear to God. So um, we, uh, well, this is, this is, this is branching off, bro. This is branching off into other stories and I can't believe I brought it, but anyway, so this is the the memorabilia pad, right? So you remember this when you were in the military, you get issued. This, so you're holding right? up for folks that are listening. You're holding up the green like military issue notepad that goes probably in your breast pocket of your of your BDUs, right, or wherever it is. Yeah, and so if you can see, I still have my notes from back when I was in, and like you know, in wow. in 2002. So uh, so I had my member, you know, this this pad that we that standard that you get issued when you go in there, and so him and I were having a conversation. And he said, I heard about Robbie Reed and I heard about this. Cause by the way, I, I ended up being a part of the film. I was kind of like an extra, but also like the liaison. It's like, if they needed to go, like I knew my way around the ship to lead the crew yeah. and everything around. They just, they were just giving me something to be a part of it. So uh, he said, I heard that Robbie Reed really responded to you and you had a really great audition and everything. I said, yeah. And I said, what are you going to do when you get out? And I said, I'm going to the military or I'm going to, to meet with Robbie, do this. And he says, okay, listen to me. He said, the, the only currency and value that you that one can have, you could go out there and if you have a certain look or certain whatever, you can get a job tomorrow, but it could be the worst thing that ever happened to you. The only currency that you have is being good at the job. This is a craft. This is a thing that you have to learn, that you have to study. You have to put your heart and soul into it because that is the only thing that will sustain your career, being popular, knowing the right people he goes all that doesn't mean anything people focus on that but the real grinders the real people that know the that made and uh, devoted their life to studying the art that's what will get you to success and that's what he said so we get so we sign this and it's you're holding up uh, to the Den screen a, de a signature from denzel it says two uh two west god bless see in the movies <laughs> and cut to last year I'm doing, uh, I got this, uh, it's like this, it was a long story, but I got this, uh, I got involved with the movie Tenet, the Christopher Nolan movie Tenet. And yeah, it, little, you know, little, movie, said, little movie, little hey, movie called Tenet with Christopher well, Nolan. I, yeah. I'm, yeah. No, I meant, I meant, I had a really little, a uh, very little part. Like they yes. called and said, hey, we're doing this thing. It's this long. And they said, you know, they're interested in you from this time to this time. And I said, I don't care what it is. I don't care how big it is. I don't care, you know, whatever. I said, I, just to be in the same room with Nolan, I'll do this. But anyway, I go there and Denzel Washington's son is the lead of this movie. And I tell him the story and I show him the pad. And he, it was just like my, and he took a picture and sent it to, you know, it's, it's crazy, you know, the world, how, how the, you know, if you, the, how the world, does things like that full you know? circle man uh, full circle, full this, circle. This, this is why full circle. I, it's one of the greatest origin stories uh in, in, <laughs> in entertainment i've heard man and for vets yeah. so many you know generations of vets that and, and military people that have this dream whether it's to be a musician or be an actor or be whatever all those everybody can relate to that moment of being in a faraway place dreaming Right. And hoping yeah. that something could happen. And you were you were ready for that moment. You were an enlisted. You were like a flight deck firefighter. Right. Is that what your job was? Or what yeah, was I was. Yeah, I worked in crash and rescue. I was aviation. So you're an enlisted guy on the deck of a ship. And and fast forward, you meet Denzel. Then you go on to be in, uh, you know, W. You were in Valley of Ella and, and you know, all these films. Now you're in the expanse. And it all started way back when. And interestingly, I got to I got to make this point. They were looking for like a military type, right? And you are, I told <laughs> right. my wife, I was like, he looks like G.I. Joe. Like he kind of looks like G.I. <laughs> Joe, right? And now fast forward, you're, you're playing all these characters where you're that guy, right? And you're doing a, right, a brilliant right. job, but I'm really grateful you shared it because 
people need to hear these stories of tenacity and 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 sacrifice and how you got there and your story is 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 you know it's it's like american idol it's it's this moment where all of a sudden something happens and your whole life changes and and that's one of the reasons why so many people root for you man it, it's really inspiring <laughs> and it's exciting and it, it's what dreams are made of right and 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 again i'm telling the highlights like there was a you know there's a lot of hard work and struggle and sleeping on couches and, and being hungry and, uh, and, and, you know, not knowing if things were going to come together or if this is what you're going to do. And then, uh, so, you know, I'm just giving the, the highlights of it, but it, it all comes with struggle. Well, it's, it's, it's an important takeaway for this time when so many folks are struggling, you feel like you've been through so much and so many times when people want to quit or give up or pack it in and, and, and your your story is, is for the dreamers, but it's also a great American success story, right? And, and you've been yeah. grinding it out. You've been you've also played some military folks in different parts, right? Which I'm sure has served you well. Now you're mm -hmm. in the expanse, which I think I will say I think is maybe the greatest sci-fi series of all time. Okay, <laughs> oh, Battlestar awesome. Galactica. People, I know that people want to battle about that. I wore so my mother knows I'm really into NASA. I, I noticed NASA. that. So she got me a commemorative Mars landing shirt that she got. That was my Easter present for me and my brother, right? So I wore that boy. in your honor, right? Um, right? Let me ask you this. Maybe some folks are, are totally into the expanse. Maybe they're not. What do you think is the most important thing about the expanse? Why is the expanse so important and so popular in, in your opinion? Well, I think that... Uh one of the things that really resonate is that, and I was having a conversation of, about this the other day, like, so take, for example, the Epstein drive, everything in the expanse. So you're looking at 150 years, 200 years from now, everything in the expanse, if, if you take something like the Epstein drive and you look, and you really look at it, it's like, that could be possible. That could work with the, in, in, in also the relations between, uh, first of all, us leaving the planet, and colonizing moon, going to Mars, colonizing Mars, then leading to the outer asteroid belts, doing um, uh, asteroid mining, uh, all of these uh, collecting resources from these things, all of these things theoretically makes sense. And so you, you, you see a show that you feel is a realistic projection of what the world or the solar system will look like 150 and 200 years from now. And there's something about that because if you, you know, and, and also the other things are fun. The fantasy is fun. If you, you know, Star Trek where they can literally molecularly take you apart and then re-put you together somewhere else, another thing. And those are fun, but it kind of, but you know, you have a little bit of a separation from reality. But if there's something where you look and you say, well, that makes sense. And that could be, you know, that could, and, and the amount of effort and time that they put into the physics and the science around the show and make it as authentic as possible, um, you know, in, in being able to achieve that, but also creating these uh, characters um, that are so, that are so human and vulnerable and make mistakes and everybody's gray and you don't really understand um, and you can understand everybody's point of view. There's nobody on the expanse, even Marco, who's slinging rocks at Earth. There's nobody that you can't identify with. Mm. And I think that if, and I think if you look at world politics now, I mean, if you really do the work and try to understand what somebody's doing or why they're acting the way they're acting, you can really get to a point where you can understand. You might disagree with it, but you understand because of the way they were grow the raised and conditioned, and what they believe in, and what's important to them, and their what they think is the right thing to do. And I think the expanse really captures that in the complexity and the nuance of this, of these greater struggles, but also on a on a micro level within you know just trying to be a decent human being and really trying to learn and and figure out how to do that. Mm. Um, so it, it fires on all those different levels because you have the the right brain and the left brain working with you have all the science and the physics, but you also have these beautiful story arcs with these interesting characters um, and this massive macro story of this intergalactic, um, you know, world uh, war with all these different worlds. And um, so, I, you know, I, I think and, and, and I think and I believe because I was a fan of the expanse the books before the show, uh, before I was a part of the show. So I think it, it fires on all those different levels mm. and it, it's rare for a show to do that.
I think that's a that's a fantastic summary and and breakdown and insight. I mean, it, it's about identity. It's about morality. It's about uh, you know colonizing. It's about oppression. It's about authoritarianism. It's about war. It's about love. It's about all these different things that 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 aren't that far away, especially in times like this where tribalism is kicking in and people are questioning nationalism and ide- all these other components rattling together incredible performances and acting across the board, you know, amazing characters, uh, you know, the nuance I think you get in a way that's really, really important that not just sci-fi fans but people who like good entertainment, but you also have this unique opportunity where you play, you know, maybe one of the most badass characters in modern entertainment, <laughs> right? Like you, if you're a Navy guy in a ship and you kind of want to like make a, a character out of nothing and say, who do I want to be, right? I mean, it comes up to being Amos Burton, right? And you're this guy that gets to pull together all these experiences in your life and be a badass character that rivals some of the characters that, you know, Bernthal, Perlman, whoever. But I think it's forever going to go down as one of the most badass characters for so many different reasons. You're, you know, you're a hero, you're a villain, you're a sex symbol, you're all of those things packed together. Um, What do you think is most important about Amos? And, And I got it coming up season six. What can you tell us? What can't you tell us? It's probably like operational security in the Navy. So I'm hoping, you know, you will you will not honor operational security and, and spill some top secret information here <laughs> for fans. But what is it right. about Amos and, and what are you excited about that's coming up and what can you tell us? Well, I think, uh, you know, I, I feel so honored and privileged to be able to tell to be able to to be a part of this story in this expanse team, but also to have a character like Amos to play. It's endlessly fascinating. Every season, I'm pulled in. You know, I, I, I don't know how many other characters that I would play were going into season six. I still have butterflies, and I'm as, um, I have as much excitement to be able to play the character as much as I do Amos. But I think one of the things that we'll 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 talk about. You know, what you were saying about being a badass. One of the things that I think is really interesting about Amos is that he has really no awareness and no no need or want to be a badass. He doesn't have an ego in that way. And the, you know, I think the simplicity of him um, on, and, and on one side, but also the complexity of him is what makes him really interesting because all he really cares about is his job, his work, and his, his, his family that's around him, the people that he ended up connecting and having loyalty to. And all these macro things that are going in the galaxy, he'll go along with it because fucking Holden is always dragging, you know, always, you know, be, you know, and, and but he knows that Holden's doing the right thing and that that Holden ultimately um, is the most moral and ethical person that he knows. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when when uh, Amos was growing up, the most important person in his life was Lydia. And it was kind of the person that raised him, who was his mother figure, but also lover, which there's a lot going on there. Yep. But ultimately what she made him, the only person that cared about him, that raised him, he had a severe, severely traumatic uh, childhood. And the only love and kindness that he was shown is from Lydia. And so his loyalty to her is, un, you know, one thing that Amos is, is very loyal. And she made him promise her that he was going to find a way to be a decent man, a decent human being, and not become the people, the abusers of the world that was around him. And so that is his main drive is to never let down the one person that ever loved him, the one person that, but he doesn't know how to do it all Mm. the time because he is, uh, he has been damaged in so many different ways. So he grabs a hold of somebody like Naomi, he grabs a hold of somebody like uh, Holden, he grabs a hold and he uses them as the as his moral compass of like, okay, if they think this is the right thing, this is the right thing, and I'm gonna fool on board. In season five, there's a moment where he gets separated from his team, and you start to see who Amos is without his people and yeah. what he's capable of. Um, and uh, and so that that's just endlessly fascinating to me. Yeah, I mean, he's uh, and I'm I'm gonna ask you to push into season. I mean, the, you know, fans of the show, if you're not a fan, like. Amos could be the last man standing at the end of the universe, right? Or he could be the guy that falls on the grenade and saves everybody or somewhere in between. Is is Amos going to make it, Wes? And is he going to make it? I got to, I'm going to ask the question, even if you can't answer it. (laughs) For for how long? You tell me. (laughs) 
to to be honest, uh, I can't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta try. You know, I gotta try. That might be one uh, of dude, the try. One of the, the, one dude, of the hardest I questions. I, I I enjoy I enjoy trying to like when you were talking about season six. I was like, oh, I'm gonna tell you a little about season. And then I started yep. thinking, I was like, I can't tell that because that leads to that, or I can't tell this because it leads well, to this or whatever. But I will say this: every uh, you know, looking back on the expanse and one of the things I'm most proud of is that everybody like me and, and Holden and Naomi, every, and, and uh, Ty and Daniel, the writers of the show and Lorraine, the, the uh, showrunner, everybody that came together, we, we really were fans of the show. We loved the show. And we kind of, what made it special is we started creating this thing and it was nowhere near what it is now. But we we created this thing that only like a, a few people, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, like a, not not a lot of people, but these fans, these hardcore fans found it and they created a foundation that we could build off of. And then the whole thing about, you know, getting uh, uh, getting canceled, but then Amazon coming to the publicity of that. It triggered something, and then the, the and then we had this foundation of fans that like were vocal, but they were tasteman. It it was like a perfect storm yeah. of luck to for it to become what it's become now. And so it's such a beautiful and sweet thing. So every time we go, you know, we were going into season six, and we are fucking focused, man, because we're like <laughs> we are so blessed, we are so lucky that we can continue this journey and that the show is as successful as it is. And, and on the level that we never would have dreamed of we went the first yep. two seasons, three seasons. And so, uh, you know, so we, we go in, you know, and, and I believe that season six is going to be our best season so far. Well, I can't wait for it. Uh, I think part of why I wanted to talk to you also is, is there's kind of a, you know, there's a populism around shows now where it's, it's, it's not unlike, you know, politics or activism where people can really make or break something. And there was such a deep, dedicated, well-organized, almost political campaign, grassroots political campaign from the fans to make sure that this thing didn't die, right? And, and all its iterations, it, it kept on. And now we're at this point where I think the world will finally understand it and appreciate it. It'll be there forever. Who knows what comes after it? It's become a launch pad for you and, and so many other talented people. Um, and, and it's exciting to watch. So I encourage everybody to watch it. It's one of my favorite shows. My five-year-old knows I go to watch it. And sometimes he'll wander. I'll go, dad, can I watch? Are you watching the expanse? Cause he's seen the <laughs> intro and I'm like, not right. yet, buddy. Maybe at some point I'll share that with him. But let me ask right. you a couple of questions I ask of all our guests. That I think are important. We're going to shift, you know, building on that. You got a great energy, man. You got a great spirit. Um, but you know, you, you've been through a lot too. And we've asked all of our guests to show used to be called angry Americans. We said, if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. You can channel that anger into many positive things. If you're pissed off, the expanse is going to get canceled. You can get involved and try to ensure that it doesn't, but you're human. You got, you know, blood pumping West Chatham. What makes you angry? I think one of the things that, uh, makes me angry and also, uh, also it gives me fear is how polarized the country is right now. I think that we, uh, the, so for me, whenever I meet somebody that I disagree with, even if it's something, I get curious about it. I'm like, why do you think that way? And I want to know more about it. And I want to hear their story. And kind of like what we were talking about the expanse, if you really make the effort to get to know somebody, at the end of the day, you still might agree with them, but you do, you understand that there's a human being on the other side, even if it's misguided, even if they've been hearing the wrong things. And so existing in a world where our own tailor-made media ecosystems, um, where you're in a completely different information uh, you, you have a completely different um, uh, information feed than the guy that lives next door to you. Mm. And you guys can, can live in this world where you have no idea what's, re what's really going on on the inside of the other person. The, when, you know, so that, to me, is, is, is tearing the country apart. And I think that, uh, you know, I think I, I miss having a place of, shared value of shared mm. principles and then we can start to we we know that that's set 
we know that we're in on this, you know, and then we can start to agree off the, that, off the, I think off the so, layers on top so, of that. It's so, it's so timely. It's so powerful. It's also part of why people love the expanse because for folks who don't know on your ship, is this crew of people from different genders, different races. You've got, you know, Martians, Earthers, and Belters working together to save the universe, right? It's this, this mm -hmm. kind of idealistic way of how we could all come together in common cause. And it's what I think mm -hmm. we hope can happen now in America and even more broadly as we fight the pandemic and many other challenges. Who knows what's yet to come? So the two are intertwined and I think it gives power and lift to this show and what you're trying to communicate as a broader message. But you also have awesome happiness and, and energy. Anybody who's around you, it's contagious. They can see it. It's why they root for you. So Wes Chatham, question I ask of, of all of our guests, Wes Chatham, what makes you happy? Well, I got to tell you, man. I mean, I think I don't, I mean, the reality is, is like uh, my, my wife and my kids and, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm out here in the woods, you know, and, and going out in the fresh air and seeing the trees and, and uh, simplifying life uh that makes me happy having conversations with you and people like you these open-minded authentic honest people that are really desperately trying to find truth commonality um but also you know really expressing who they are and what they believe in and, and standing up for what they believe in um you know that makes me happy um and uh uh and in and, and being able to have in a creative expression like the expanse um, and, and, you know, I have so much gratitude for, for being able to, to, you know, to be a part of this thing that I've always dreamed about. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, I feel, I feel very lucky. I feel very blessed. And, uh, and, and that makes me happy. Well, I think it makes, it makes me and all your fans happy to see you succeed. And we know there's a lot more to come, whether it's- What, what makes you uh, happy? Man, I mean, uh, you know, obviously family, right? And 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 purpose. Um, I mean, for me in the pandemic, the thing that I've been really going back to is music. Like I mm -hmm. need music like I need air. And and mm -hmm. and that has really given me, uh, you know, when I really need a shift and you probably know this from being on deployment, you know, if I need just a three minute vacation, I could play mm -hmm. a Stevie Ray song or something else that brings me back to a different time and a different place. And it gives me that, Dose. I mean, today, before we recorded this, we found out the new Hall of Fame, uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame list came out. And it's like mm -hmm. the Foo Fighters, Tina Turner, Randy Rhodes, the guitarist from, from Ozzy, Jay-Z. You know, it's this group of people that I love. And I felt like that was uh, kind of like what we needed this year after this fucked do you, up year. Do you play music? Badly. You know, and I'm trying to teach my kids. Yeah. They both got drum sets right through there. Uh, and I'm yeah. in a place where there's a lot of music. So I think it's really, I've, I've realized as I've gotten older, how essential it is to my happiness. And, and mm -hmm. that's really been a driving force for me, you know? I read somewhere and, and this really struck me and I, I wish I could remember the name of who said this, but who I, who I read was quoting somebody else. So it's, it's a, you know, I'm sure it's pretty famous, mm -hmm. but they said that the, the, the goal that they have in life is really simple a quiet mind, a fit body, and a house full of love. Mm. And I heard those goals and, and, I, and I thought how simple and how clear that is. And the reality is if you can get those combinations right, and a fit body is not about vanity, it's about being healthy, you know, yeah. it's about health. Yeah. But if you get those combination things right, you know, in a quiet mind and a house full of love, that's it, man, you know, that's like it. Those, that's, I love yeah, it. That's it. I tell my boys yeah. all the time. They, they, they repeat it every day that, you know, we say it's going to be a great day. And then they say strong of body, strong of heart, strong of mind. And they think about that and they're conscious of that. And they're out in the world. I hope, you know, spreading that and you're spreading a lot. I have to pivot into giving you gifts. This is part of it. I wish we could do this in person. I want to do this again, but I also want to be mindful of the fact that my kids coming home from school, your kids are coming home from school and that house is going to be really full of love in, in a couple of minutes. Right. And so, uh, <laughs> I got to get you some gifts. I'm going to send you some independent Americans gear. Uh, you know, having you wear it a rocket would be an awesome, honor man. and a privilege. You can yeah, take it well. out into, into the universe. We also got some uncle nearest whiskey coming your way, Ow, which you, which you yeah, can, I'll make good. I'll make good. Hey, I just told you about my struggles with alcohol. And, well, you can I'll, give it, I'll, you can, welcome it. you can give it to that guy. You can give it to that uh, guy no, who I'll, gave you, no, no, give it to the guy I'm who gave you the Camaro. Nobody. 
<laughs> you can give it to the guy who gave you the Camaro or you can put, and then the, the last gift that's a question, right? And we ask all our guests of this, even no matter what time of year it is, the Easter candy peeps is legendary. Okay. And there are three colors. That's blue, awesome, man. Blue, yellow, or pink. West Chatham, which color would you choose and why? I'm going to go blue because my kids love that. And my oldest, Nash, his favorite color is blue. So uh, he would he would love that. There you go, man. There you go, man. I, yeah. I love it. I want to I want to thank you for for your candor, for your stories, for your inspiration and just for being somebody that we can root for and that our kids can look up to. Congratulations on all the success, man. And we're excited to watch what comes next for you, man. Hey, vice versa. And thank you for having me on. It's been an honor. And that uh, was great talking to you. And, and if you uh, if I can help out in anything that you're doing, just let me know. So right now, just keep being you. If you got pictures of that Camaro, you know, and you next to it, you know, that would be, I think the fans around the world would like to see that. Maybe one day we can do a giant reunion when the pandemic's over and get you and Denzel in that car. And that would be <laughs> an, epic, an epic reunion, right? I, put it on uh, the top of an aircraft carrier and do an expanse activation or something, man. We'll take it way over the top and get... That would be and, a fun thing for me to try to find one of those pictures because I'd love to see that thing. Again. Well, well, fans around the world, so it's it, you have your mission. You have many missions after this episode. <laughs> the great and powerful yeah. West Chatham. Thank you, my friend. Uh, stay frosty you, and stay vigilant. Thanks, buddy.